Good evening. Welcome to the East Providence Local Advisory Committee for Special Education meeting. Tonight, we are here to have a workshop with Tap of the Watchin on helping your child with returning to school with anxiety. Um, the East Providence Local Advisory Committee is comprised of parents and of children with disabilities, along with administrators, educators, and others. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, who are here to promote and advocate for our children for quality education. Um, we welcome all new members. If you have any questions, give us a shout out in an email. But tonight I'd like to introduce our special ed director, Leslie Anderson, head of pupil personnel. Leslie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first event for EPLAC for this school year. Uh, 2021. It certainly um, has brought with it its own um, challenges and um, we're venturing into all kinds of exciting new things. Um, I look forward to a really um, exciting and um, uh, certainly uh, uh, good year for, for us, for our parents, for our students, for our staff, um, I'll take a quick moment also and introduce Bud, whom many of you know, and I'm sure he'll have a few things to say tonight as well. Okay, am I live? Very good. Welcome, everybody. It's good to, uh, to be back in the swing of things. It's been a, a long while. Uh, we have a great presentation. Tabitha put a lot of work into putting together tonight's uh, professional development opportunity. And I think everybody's going to find it enriching and rewarding. So sit back, enjoy, um, use the chat to ask questions, uh, but feel free to um, enjoy the evening's presentation. And thank you for attending. All set. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Tabitha Watchin. Take it away, Tabitha. Just making sure that my am I good? Okay, just making sure my video and, and mic are on. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Tabitha Watson, and I'm the social emotional learning facilitator for the East Providence School District. Um, thank you to Mary and to Eplac for inviting me here tonight to talk to you about um, anxiety and helping your, your child or our students who may be experiencing anxiety as it relates to returning to school. Um, so one thing I wanna mention before we get started tonight is that the slides are um, loaded with resources that you'll be able to take away after tonight's presentation. So if you wanted to go ahead and open this bit.ly that you see down at the bottom of the screen in an, oops, excuse me, another browser that will give you access to the slides. So if you just type in that, this web address right here, um, bit.ly slash eplac slides 930 into a, another tab in your browser, it will give you access to the slides and the additional resources. Um, if you don't wanna do that tonight, that's okay. You will have access to the slides um, after the fact that will be posted on the EPLAC website as well as the district website. So you'll, you'll be able to walk away with some resources to support you as we move forward. Um, but go ahead and feel free to open them tonight if you wanna follow along on your own. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about anxiety. What is it, what is it exactly? What are some common signs that you might see um, if, your if your children are exhibiting anxiety? I'm going to talk a little bit about what has changed with school and what the restrictions are related to COVID um, and how that might be producing some, re some anxiety within your children. Um, we'll talk about some strategies that you might use for supporting your child through that anxiety. And then, like I said, tons of uh, additional resources to support you in your journey as we go forward. There will be some time for questions at the end of this presentation. So what I would ask you to do is just hold your questions until the end, um, but go ahead and type them in the YouTube chat and Leslie will be monitoring them. So we'll have some time to kind of get to those um, towards the end. So anxiety, what is it? It's a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. And I, I underlined uncertain 
um, because that that's the piece that typically um, sort of fuels the anxiety. This this feeling of not being able to predict what's coming next or know what's coming next um, or have control over you know something that's happening in your world. And so we all um, likely have experienced anxiety at some point in our lives, be it long-term kind of ongoing anxiety or situational anxiety. Um, I'm not sure what happened here. I think Alfred took over my screen, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. So we've all experienced this um, from time to time and um, we know what that feels like. And we may have some experience from previous events in our lives that help us to kind of cope or we maybe have developed some coping skills along the way, but our children necessarily haven't developed those skills yet. So they're, they're observing the world around them, perceiving the world around them, trying to make sense of it and understand it. Um, and at the same time, trying to understand feelings they have about what's happening in the world and changes that are happening in the world. Um, not necessarily just related to COVID, but certainly now. And so um, the thing that they're missing is the skills to cope with the anxiety or to help themselves through. And so they, they need us to sort of help them through. Um, that anxiety though, sometimes isn't really obvious. So it often uh, shows itself by, uh, through behaviors, common behaviors that we see in children often, but don't necessarily um, always equate to anxiety. And so what, are those, what do those behaviors look like or signs that, that your child is feeling anxious? Um, you can go ahead and take a look at, at these um, common, common signs that you, you're probably familiar with. Um, defiance, irritability, sleep difficulties, changes in appetite, lack of concentration, maybe a, the child is constantly worrying, um, maybe they sort of have bottled up and are not really willing to talk about how they're feeling. There may be butterflies in their stomach or stomach aches that are not related to other illnesses. Same with headaches that are not related to other illnesses. You may, set, you may notice that they're lethargic or have less energy. They may be more sad than, than typical. Um, there may be more crying than typical. They may put up a fight about going to school, um, meltdowns before school about things like how to do their hair or clothing or socks or shoes, uh, meltdowns after school about uh, doing homework. And then at school, you may see some difficulties transitioning between activities. So these are, these are, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but some of the more common things that you, you might notice, um, and they certainly might look familiar. I, I know I see my fourth grade self in this list. If I think back to um, who I was as a child, I was definitely one who worried a lot, um, who was quiet and contemplative, and who cried when I was overwhelmed and anxious. And so what I didn't know back then was how to talk about what I was feeling and how to, how to ask for help. But my mom certainly recognized these signs and helped me learn how to talk about the hard stuff. And so I see myself in here with the crying and the worrying. Um, and I know that this happens with some of our children too, but it can be frustrating as a parent to um, not know what the cause of those behaviors are. So, you know, if your child is crying all the time and you don't know why, that can feel frustrating. If every morning is a battle to get out of the house because of the socks or the shoes or the hair, it really isn't about the socks or the shoes or the hair. Um, but we, if you don't know that, it can feel frustrating. Um, and so as we progress through the remaining slides, we're going to talk about some strategies that you can use to support your child if they're feeling anxious. But before we do that, I wanna draw your attention to um, the, the teal bar at the bottom of this slide um, that says, remember, behavior is information. And so every time a child is exhibiting behavior, it's for a reason. And I, I kind of like to equate it to a baby crying. You know, just what, like we know when a baby cries that um, instinctively we know that baby needs something. And they're trying to tell us that in the only way that they know how, um, which is through crying. And so we will respond to those needs instinctively because, you know, we tend to learn what, what the crying um, is signifying. 
our young children and even our teenagers, they don't necessarily have the words to it or sometimes the courage to express their feelings and emotions. And so it comes out in other ways, which is sometimes through these behaviors. So if, if, the, if nothing else sticks with you from tonight's present presentation, I hope that um, the idea that behavior is information is what you take away from tonight. I'm going to go ahead and just show you the note. I'm gonna stop. Uh. Okay, so if you have the, um, I can't show you on mine right now, but if you have the slides open on your um, screen, down at the bottom in the notes section, um, there are some links to additional information, articles and information about um, signs of anxiety uh, in your children and anxiety due to that is specific related to returning to school um, during COVID. So there's additional links in the notes section of the screens that you'll be able to, of the slides that you'll be able to access um, either right now if you have the slides open or later on when you go back to look at them. So here we are back at school. We've been at it for a couple of weeks now. Um, and regardless of which model your child is doing, whether um, it's the hybrid model or the distance learning model or they're fully in person, um, <clears throat> there's been a ton of changes. And so I'm sure that returning to school was exciting for a lot of, um, a lot of our students. They were looking forward to seeing old friends, making new friends, seeing old teachers, meeting new teachers, routine normalcy, uh, routine and normalcy. I mean, that was certainly missing from um, all of our lives for a few months. So getting back to school kind of gives us all that sense of routine and normalcy, um, excited to, to learn new material and recess, right? That's what everybody comes to school for. We love recess. Um, but with the return of school, there certainly were um, plenty of changes that happened. And so, those include new bus rules and restrictions, increased focus on hand washing and sanitizing, um, mask wearing, hallway traffic patterns, uh, six feet of distance from our friends and from our teachers, um, and the different models of learning that we have certainly um, we talked about already. And then also there's been new uh, routines for lunch and recess. So some of those things that we were looking forward to have changed tremendously. And certainly um, those changes, you know, could be causing some anxiety in some children. Now, some of our children are going to roll with these changes and just be excited to be back to school and be totally fine with everything. But others may feel, you know, this sense of loss because school as they knew it um, looks different. They may be overwhelmed by the changes or stressed by the changes uh, or simply just uncomfortable. And so whether you know your child is rolling with it and totally okay or feeling some sort of discomfort, it's an adjustment to all of us. Um, and, and it may take some longer than others to adjust. So in the, in the notes section of this screen, you will notice that there, there is linked to it, the return to learn plan for East Providence schools. If you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, it, it outlines our plan for returning to school and those changes. And then there's also um, a really great resource with uh, many social stories for young and older children um, on COVID-19. And it includes social stories about, the cha about changes in bus rules and changes in routines, as well as information about COVID. So if your child is one who really benefits from social stories to um, develop a better understanding of changes in social context, that's a really great resource for you. So as we progress through the rest of the presentation, we're going to talk about um, strategies for supporting your child. And so this is the list of strategies that we're going to kind of cover in, in depth as we move forward. We're going to talk about open and honest conversations. Um, we're going to talk about listening, validating, and problem solving as ways to um, support your child. We're going to talk about discussing what's within and without and outside of the child's control and helping them to understand that. Um, identifying what's going well, creating predictable routines, modeling calming be calm behavior, and then calming techniques. So um, open and honest conversations. So 
you want to make sure that um, you're talking with your child and helping them to understand what's happening with COVID and why the world is different than they may have known it. And we know that there's a great deal of information out there about, the, about COVID. Um, much of it misinformation. And so that misinformation may be widely shared um, and easily accessible, especially if your child is um, participating in social media. And some of that information is certainly um, swayed by social and political views. And so with the widespread of information that's out there, we definitely want to make sure that children have accurate information that's fact-based and age appropriate, and that we're careful to monitor that so that they're not overwhelmed with and inundated with the information that's out there, which can be even hard for adults to kind of weed through and process. So we want to make sure that we're helping young children to kind of process the information that they, they are hearing to make sure that it's fact-based and that they understand um, what's factual about the virus. And then that, and that we're also monitoring the amount of information that they're taking in about the virus. Um, you want to, when you're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're talking about this information, you want to be calm but reassuring. So be comfortable and be comfortable with I don't know, right? So we don't all know um, the facts or all of the information about this virus, and we don't need to pretend that we do, but just kind of embrace the uncertainty and use it as an opportunity to learn together. And then also as an opportunity to let your child know that sometimes we might not have all the answers, but that you're in it together as, as a family. So um, there's in these thought bubbles, there's um, some questions that you can use to prompt those conversations with your child, uh, whether you have a younger child, which you'll see in the yellow bubble or an older child in the teal bubble, there's some some conversation starters there that might be helpful. In the note, take, in the note section, um, there are a ton of resources about how to talk to your child about coronavirus um, and about disease outbreaks. And then um, there's some links to emotional uh, wheel, the, the emotion wheel and the emotion wheel activity, which can give you some support with helping your child be able to express what they're feeling and helping them build that vocabulary around feelings and emotions so that they are better able to express themselves. Um, so some great resources um, in the bottom of this slide as well. Excuse me. Right. So listen and validate and problem solve. Um, you want to allow your child uninterrupted time and space to talk through their feelings and their thoughts and, and ask questions that they may be having. And, and we all know that we're surrounded by plenty of distractions um, right now with social media and TV and work and everything that we're juggling. Um, there's plenty of distractions, but the, this is a really important time to be able to put those devices away, turn off the TV, kind of set aside everything else for the, from the day and just be able to talk with your child um, in an in, in a, an undistracted way. And so just give, give them your undivided attention, allow them to kind of talk through whatever it is that they're feeling or, or experiencing and without interrupting them. So I, I want you to try to be cautious not to plan your response, but just listen. And then when it is your turn, using caring statements like I can understand why you would feel that way, or I can I could see how that would be frustrating, um, is really helpful to validate what your child is feeling, even if it's not necessarily um, something that you agree with or feel is accurate, still validating those feelings and trying to understand why he or she may be feeling them is going to be really important. Um, you want to identify reasons why your child might be feeling worried or anxious. And then really important, and that's why it's in bold print, is being able to help your child identify possible solutions and select which one is best. And the reason why this is important is because we talked about the fact that ch children haven't necessarily developed their, their problem solving skills yet or the skills that um, they need to be able to sort of navigate this unfamiliar world on their own. And so giving them the, uh, helping them to identify possible solutions and empowering them to come up with those ideas on their own, and then empowering them to make the best decision that they can make for themselves um, will really help them in the long run to be independent problem solvers. 
Um, so in the bottom of this slide, you'll see some additional resources about um, parent, how to uh, validate your children's feelings. And then uh, this is a children's book that I love right here in the corner called What Do You Do With a Problem? Uh, frankly, I think it's good for adults too. It's good for all ages. Um, it's, I'm always inspired by how children's books um, you know, really share such strong messages and important messages. And so um, this is a story for anyone at any age who has ever had a problem um, that they just wish would go away. And um, if you click when you're in the slides, if you click right on the book, it will take you to a read aloud of the book um, from YouTube that you could watch with your child if you, if you didn't have access to the actual physical copy of the book. So helping your child to identify what is within his or her control and then what's outside of their control. Um, we talked about with the definition of anxiety, um, that, that piece that's about uncertainty and how the uncertainty is of, of the situation is typically what causes someone to feel anxious. This feeling of not being able to control or uh, what's happening in their world or, or anticipate what, what's gonna happen next kind of produces those anxious feelings. And so talking through what's within my control. Right now in, related, in relation to the virus, what's within your child's control? He or she can avoid touching his face or her face, washing their hands, um, using sanitizer if needed, if they are not able to wash their hands, um, keeping their distance from others, wearing their mask and keeping that mask clean, following instructions and getting a good night's sleep. So those are things that your child absolutely can manage, can control, can, can own. The things that they cannot control are whether or not another student or adult gets sick or contracts COVID. That very much may be on the mind of your child and that could be something that they're feeling anxious about. The idea of kind of bringing home the, the virus to your family or to loved ones, grandparents, et cetera, might be something children are thinking about. And so um, knowing that that's really not within their control. They, there's nothing that any of us can do about that other than staying safe, keeping our hands clean, wearing our mask, those things that we can handle. Um, also outside of your child's control is the action and behaviors of others. So, you know, if there's a child in their class who's struggling to wear the mask or can't wear the mask for, you know, a health reason, um, that's outside of any of, uh, of your child's control. There's nothing um, he or she can do about that. And so knowing and accepting that the only behaviors or actions that they're in control of are, are their own um, is certainly a, a hard lesson for some to learn, but one that may help them to decrease feelings of anger, frustration, anxiety. And then the new rules. The new rules at school and in society may be really frustrating as they've changed everyone's life. Um, and your child may be struggling with the idea of these new rules and not like them, or maybe feel uncertain or anxious about them. <clears throat> and so um, knowing that we don't make the rules and we aren't necessarily in the position to change them, um, it's going to be really important to helping your child really kind of stay within that locus of control and understanding what they have um, power over. And what they have power over is basically what's in the blue box as it relates to COVID. We have another really great children's book here that was um, written by, I say, professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, specifically to help children deal with the stress and anxiety of the COVID epidemic. And so um, it really helps to ground your child to understand that right now I'm fine. Exactly what the title says. Right now I'm fine. I'm not sick. Um, I am managing what I can manage and controlling what I can control. And right now I'm fine. And so that's a really great read aloud. Again, if you click on the cover of the book, you'll be able, to, it will take you to um, a, a YouTube video of the read aloud if you don't have the hard copy of the book. But it's a really great story to kind of read through a few times with your child um, and, and help to ground them in that feeling of, you know what, right now I'm okay. Additionally, um, I also linked the social stories links again in the bottom um, in the notes section of these slides. It's the same social stories that you saw in a previous slide, but again, I thought those would be really important. So I didn't want you to have to go back searching for them. So talking about what's going well, I love this focus on um, the positive 
and being able to kind of reframe what's happening in the world. So it's really, really easy to focus on what's difficult or what's challenging um, when you're feeling stressed or anxious um, and helping to shift that perspective by focusing on what's going well can really help your child to do that reframing of the negative um, and, and, and help to lift the weight that all of the negative can sometimes carry. And so um, you might ask your child, you know, what are you looking forward to about school? What was the best thing that happened today? And these are really great conversations to have if you're able, you know, if you're the if you're a family that has dedicated time to sort of enjoy dinner together every night, um, this might be a good dinner conversation to talk about what went well today and use the questions in the thought bubble to help those discussions. If dinner time conversations don't work for you, finding another time, maybe it's on the car ride home from school or um, on the car ride to soccer practice, something that uh, some dedicated time in the in the evening after school to kind of reframe the day talk about what went well and focus on the positive another really fun activity that you can do as a family is to create this positivity jar i won't lie i actually have one um, that i keep on my desk as well and so the positivity jar is um, really just taking an, an empty container whether it's a jar or like a plastic bottle or a bowl even um, and having some small slips of paper available for your entire family and every day just kind of think about what what was positive that happened that day what made you happy what brought a smile to your face um, write it down on the slip of paper i like to put the date on it and then and then fold it up and put it in the container and choose your time whether it's at the end of the week or the month or the year to to pull out all of those pieces of paper and open them up and reflect on them as a family and it really brings a smile to your face and kind of uh, gives you an opportunity to relive some of the great moments that happened that week or that month or that year um, and, and helps you to remember that while right now we're living through difficult times and things can seem challenging, it's not all bad. There's still good things happening and it's a really good way to help you um, remember that, um, that there's positive things happening every single day. And then the last strategy in this blue box, happy thought, happy thoughts bedtime routine. I'm stealing from my best friend. We were, we were actually college roommates and every night before we fell asleep, she would, she would ask me to share um, three happy thoughts from the day. And I thought it was silly when I was young and now I love it, of course. And she still keeps that, um, that tradition going with her. She has young children and she keeps that tradition going with them. Um, but what a great bedtime routine. Before your child goes to sleep, just having them share three happy thoughts from their day and letting them fall asleep with happy thoughts on their mind versus um, falling asleep with heavy thoughts on their mind. Um, there is a link in the notes se section of this slide to a blog about the positivity jar um, that written by, by uh, a family who used it at a really difficult time in their life and how it really helped to frame that time and to keep them positive during that time. And so if you if you wanted to read through uh, an actual real life experience of using that positivity jar, it's linked there for you. Okay, so creating predictable routines. I think we all probably do better with um, situations that we can predict, that we are comfortable with, that we can understand you know, what's gonna happen next. And certainly our kids really do well with that. I think part of the uh, need to go back to school is that that is for that routine. We all do better when we have routines. Even in the classroom, we talk about this a lot, about um, creating routines and expectations that are predictable so that students understand how the classroom works. And this, this is also um, really essential for home as well. And so we talked earlier about, you know, uh, meltdowns happening before school and after school. And so one way to kind of, um, you know, kind of prepare to uh, eliminate those things are to prepare for the next day, the night before. So prepare your outfit, pick out the clothes you're going to wear, have them laid out. Um, your, your child will, will know which socks they're gonna put on so it won't be a battle in the morning. Um, they'll know what shoes to wear so it won't be a battle looking you know, for the missing sneaker. Um, and so everything will be laid out and ready. Um, if your child brings lunch to school, packing that lunch the night before so that it's all ready and we're not scrambling to do it in the morning, Organizing a backpack is a really important one. You know, most of our children struggle with organi organization. That's an, um, 
an executive function skill that um, they're, they're not really developed um, with yet. And so organizing that backpack each day can be really helpful. Um, we all know that the black backpacks can sort of become like a black hole where things just kind of pile up over the year. And then it gets really overwhelming to, to stay organized and to, to locate the materials you need each day. And so making sure that we have sort of an organized system for that can be really helpful. Um, dedicating space and time for co completing homework. Um, you know, if your child, same thing, uh, you know, as the organized backpack, if they have a space where, you know, they have pencils, they have pens, they have materials they need, they can sit, whether it's at the kitchen table or a little space in the living room or a desk in their bedroom, whatever works in, in your home space, but that can be a dedicated space and a dedicated time. We don't wanna be scrambling to do homework at eight o'clock at night before we go to bed. So if there's a time that works for your family to kind of say, this is homework time, we're gonna get it done. And then leave space and time for preferred activities after school. So in the same way that as adults, we just need downtime after a long day, so do kids. And so if there's time for them to go outside, ride their bike, play Legos, you know, do some arts and crafts, whatever it is that's a preferred activity for your child, really important that they have that time. And even if it's quiet time where, you know, they like to work on puzzles and they're doing puzzles by themselves or they're reading a book, whatever it is that kind of helps them sort of deescalate and calm down before bedtime um, will really be helpful to not always feel like it's a race to get ready for the next day. Um, for, for children who really do well with visuals and can um, and, and need visuals to help them understand kind of the schedule for the day, creating a picture schedule um, will really be helpful so that they know what's coming next. Sometimes for our students who need those visuals, um, not knowing what's coming next is what causes the anxiety. So not being able to predict that, you know, um, we're going for a walk at five o'clock or dinner is at six o'clock or I have to take a shower at seven o'clock or bedtime is at eight o'clock. You know, not being able to predict that without a schedule can really be challenging and increase anxiety. And so having a picture schedule at home um, or, or if your child doesn't need visuals, just a regular schedule at home can be really helpful as well. And then really important is a consistent sleep schedule. Um, having a bedtime, no matter what age you are, even adults, um, is essential so that you can ensure that you're getting um, the appropriate amount of sleep, your child's getting the appropriate amount of sleep. Um, that sleep is really gonna be helpful to having a smooth um, morning before school and a smooth day at school. Uh, linked in this slide is um, some information about about school mornings without stress. So if your mornings are difficult, that might be a resource that you check out. All right. Modeling calm behavior. This is for you parents and, and teachers. So the behaviors that we talked about at the beginning of this, of this presentation, like I mentioned, can be really frustrating, um, can sometimes just, you know, really uh, after a long day be difficult for us to handle. Um, if you've had a long, exhausting day, you may not have the resilience you need to handle them. And so it can be a challenge. And um, I don't, you know, I don't take that lightly at all. But but I also know that um, our children respond to our energy, both in the classroom and at home. So this is really important for teachers as well as students that if you are feeling anxious, stressed, unorganized, frazzled, they will too. And so re remembering that um, they're responding to your energy and they're looking to you um, to model behavior. Here's some tips. I, I chose this pretty beach scene background so that we could all feel a little calm right now, but remaining calm, modeling a confident attitude, using positive language and develop, uh, demonstrating, excuse me, empathy when your child is upset, crying, etc. You know, I don't take that lightly. I know that's difficult to do um, on, on really tough days, but I think it makes all the difference in terms of how your child responds or how they are able to kind of deescalate and come around. If you're calm, they'll they'll more quickly be calm. If you um, are anxious through the whole thing, that will escalate their anxiety. If you're frazzled and yelling or you know, um, using tough language, that's gonna sort of um, exacerbate the situation. And so as much as you can, try to model calm behavior. Also for you parents and teachers, um, 
practicing and modeling self-care. So we talked about the importance a few minutes ago of your child having time every day to kind of do the things that they enjoy doing that helps them to stay calm and de-escalate and kind of enjoy their day a little bit. You need that time as well. And I, I know that can be really hard to find um, when you're, you know, working and parenting and um, managing schedules and there's so many responsibilities and balls up in the air. Um, but I, you know, this saying can be a little cliche, but I also think it's really, really important to remember that you just can't pour from an empty cup. And so you have to, you know, um, put your oxygen mask on first, so to speak, and take care of yourself. And so um, take breaks when you need them. Again, get plenty of sleep. You need a bedtime too. Um, even though you're the adult, your bedtime matters. Um, and, and exercising as much as you can, you know, if, even if it's taking the stairs at work during the day or getting outside at, at lunchtime and going for a quick walk and getting some fresh air, getting that exercise in will really help to kind of keep you calm and keep your resilience up, eating healthy foods, staying hydrated, also engaging in activities that you enjoy. If, if your child has some reading time or play time, maybe that's time for you to also model how important that is, whether you like to read or do arts and crafts or garden or, you know, um, catch up with some friends, whatever it is, taking time to stay connected and do things that you enjoy will be really important for your mental health in order to be able to respond to your child's mental health in a positive way. Um, and so linked in the bottom of this screen is a, um, a weekly newsletter that that I'm creating for um, faculty and staff in the East Providence School District to um, just kind of help with these reminders of self-care and take, you know, um, and, and personal wellness. Um, certainly uh, some of the aspects of the newsletter are for school department employees, but um, lots of pieces of the newsletter are applicable to anyone who wants to read it. And so you can follow um, us on EP underscore STL on Twitter. Um, and you can see that newsletter each week if you're looking for some, some tips and strategies. And it's an interactive newsletter, so it's not just material to read, but sometimes there's really good meditation videos or some music or some exercise videos that you might um, really appreciate. There's recipes for healthy food. So, so please do follow us on Twitter um, and feel free to read that newsletter if you're, if you're looking for some inspiration on how to um, take better care of yourself. This week's newsletter is linked at the bottom of that previous slide if you want to take a look. And then um, on this last slide here is uh, a resource that I want to leave you with so that you have some tools and strategies at home that you might be able to use with your child who um, needs some, some calming techniques. And so things like breathing exercises, movement, again, getting that exercise in um, will be really important for maintaining um, some calmness and getting out some of the anxiety from the day. Um, puzzles, games, coloring. I'm a big coloring fan. I talk about it all the time, but I love to color just to kind of take a few minutes to sort of de-escalate myself or refocus when I need it. Calming music is always really helpful. Um, pet therapy. So if you are a pet family, you know, taking time to kind of play with the play with the dog or cat or whatever pet you have at home or take it for a walk or just spending time with, with pets can be helpful. Getting out in nature is really, really good for the mind and the brain and your mental health and then meditation. And so this, um, I'm going to take you to another link in a second, but this virtual calming room is, is um, something I created to support teachers and students in the classroom this year in place of the fact that we cannot create those um, cozy calming corners in our classroom this year due to COVID restrictions. So um, I created this, this website that you certainly can access um, from this bit.ly that has really great resources. I'm gonna to move to there now so you're able to see it. Um, really great resources for just um, calming your child or yourself when you need it. And so you can click on any one of these icons down here or the same tabs up here to take you to, um, I'll take you to the sounds and music one, which is one of my favorite, um, where you'll find a variety of videos that, um, you know, are nature sounds or beach waves. Um, there's some some really cool videos that have like really relaxing, just instrumental music. Um, and then 
one of my colleagues really um, wanted to see some Disney in here because she loves Disney. And so here we have some Disney editions. Um, I actually had this playing in the office today it was really good, really like peaceful, calming Disney, um, no words, just music. Um, that really, you know, if you're a Disney fan can be fun. So another fun tab is um, visual relaxation. Uh, so again, there's something very calming about just watching the fireplace. And this is really a video of the fireplace going. And so, you know, if your child um, just needs something peaceful uh, to look at and visualize, there's some really good videos here. And there's something for everyone here. There's more ab abstract um, videos like these, this kaleidoscope or these breathing circles. Um, there's an aquarium here, um, some more underwater, snow falling. It's really fun to just kind of explore these. Um, the, these are really fun, these uh, coffee house. It's just literally a video of a coffee house with some calming music. Um, and then more Disney down here from my Disney friend. This, uh, these, this is a really fun one. It's the Disney fireworks display um, at the end of the night from the Magic Kingdom. So if you're Disney fans, there's, there's stuff for you here too. Um, I'm gonna take you to one more page and then I'll allow you to kind of explore this whole virtual calming room on your own. Um, this animal cam is really fun. So I talked about pet therapy. If you don't have a pet, but your child really loves dogs, um, there's a puppy video here for you. If your child, you know, is a, a panda fan or, um, or loves elephants, there are uh, great videos here. And these are live um, webcams. So they run for, I mean, just they're ongoing. And so as much time as you want to allow your child to kind of hang out with the pandas or watch the puppies play, um, the, it's a live cam there for you to watch. And so um, there's so many more um, tools in here that I hope you'll take advantage of at home. I heard today that some teachers are taking advantage of it in the classroom, which I'm really excited about. Um, so your child may be familiar with it. I actually have a, a nephew in high school who I shared this with and said, pass it on to your friends. And he was just over the moon about how cool it is. So um, hopefully this is you find this helpful um, for your child at home or even you. If you really need some relaxing music or visual relaxation, by all means, um, explore this room and utilize it, share it with your friends, and I hope you find it helpful. Um, it is linked in the bottom of the of this slide deck and it's also linked back on the on the slide right here. So again, these slides will be posted to the, the websites. Um, you certainly are free to open them now. If you if you have them open in your browser, play around with those resources and explore them. Um, and then it's it's time for questions. So if you have questions, um, go ahead and type them in the chat. And then Leslie is going to kind of share them out, and we can we can go from there. Leslie. So the chat on YouTube is just a few seconds behind the. Okay. So it might take a few few seconds to get some questions. No problem. How are we doing, 
Leslie, any, any questions? Not so far. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and just leave up my contact information. You can always reach out to me at um, twatchin at epschoolsri.com if you do um, leave this presentation and have some questions that you, you would like to ask, feel free to email me there. Um, you can also, again, follow us on EP underscore SEL on Twitter, um, where, where we, we post the weekly newsletters and we post other um, resources information um, related to social emotional learning. So feel free to follow us there. We welcome you and hope that you will. Leslie, if we don't have any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Heather. I think it's gonna take us out of this presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Tabitha. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone once again for joining in for our workshop, which was extremely helpful for me and I'm sure it was for everybody else. So thank you again, Tabitha. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we are not having our regular meeting after this workshop tonight, but we will be having one Wednesday, October 28th at 6.30 via Zoom. So please join us, details will follow. And if you have any questions at any time, please um, contact us through our email, which is epblack at epschoolsri.com and we will help you any way we can. Thanks again for joining.